Yeah, I would say uh, as a founder looking for money, the two critical things are you have to be a domain expert in your space, but then you also have to be a domain expert and people will fund your space as well. Welcome to Forging the Future. And today I'm talking to Moema Lambe, angel investor, startup advisor, and generally just a great friend with a wealth of knowledge. So it's great to have you on, Moema. Thank you for having me. Great to be here. Uncle Moema. <laughs> exactly. Uncle Moema. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, let's just jump into it. You have an extensive knowledge of technology, but, you know, uh, you and I met and uh, our impact has become angel investing, right? You were doing it before. I was trying to learn how to do it. How did we meet? We met... I think we met at a tech conference during lunch, I think. Yeah. We were, we were like trying to find a for space place for a to sandwich. Sit. <laughs> yeah. We, we met at a tech conference. We're trying to find a place to sit. And uh, it was crowded and it was like 10,000 people there. San Francisco. In San Francisco, mm -hmm. somewhere, uh, not the Palace of Fine Arts, but some, somewhere like that. Mm -hmm. And then we just, you got a sandwich, I got a sandwich. We sat down, clicked and hit it off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just love those kinds of collisions in life, right? Hey, can I sit here? I'm just there to have a sandwich. I don't know you. You don't know me. We start talking. We figure out that we think the same way on just about everything. Exactly. And uh, that was several years ago. Uh, and so that's one thing that we really try to teach our startups and the fact that a lot of times at an event, the in-between moments are more important than what you're there for, mm -hmm. right? You know, Absolutely. Certainly you can get some value in listening to someone speak, but you know, get out into the lobby and talk to someone you don't know. Exactly. You never know what's gonna happen. Get out of your comfort zone. Exactly. Be get comfortable your, being uncomfortable. Exactly, that would, uh, you were, I don't think you were there yesterday, but that's exactly what Billy Grandier had a studio. His whole talk was about, was getting outside your comfort zone. Excellent. Uh, so what are some challenges that you faced earlier in your investment career? How did you get outside your comfort zone? Cause you didn't start out being an investor. Uh, no, I, I played around in real estate and then from that put some money into the stock market. And then from that wanted to, uh, diversify into a different asset class or so angel investing. Mm -hmm. I was living in New York and the challenge I had was, uh, getting access to deal flow, um, and getting quality deal flow. Uh, while you were in New York. While I was in New York. Mm -hmm. um, and I figured the way to hack that was to move to San Francisco. So about a decade ago, I moved to San Francisco. Uh, and by being in San Francisco, I was in the ecosystem. And then I had the opposite problem of tremendous access and too much deal flow and not enough power to, to, deploy, to deploy that deal flow. Mm -hmm. And so how did you, how did you approach that? Uh, filtering. I mean, being selective about deals. Uh, 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 thinking about uh, investment theses. Mm -hmm. Some people have an investment thesis. Initially, I wanted to focus on my core expertise of compliance and cybersecurity, uh, but then I took a step back and became agnostic, be, being more opportunistic as an angel investor. Mm -hmm. And then um, I think now you've been in something like half a dozen unicorns or something? Yep, I've kind been of. in 100 deals, about six unicorns. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so far, so good. Yeah. Yes. Now, angel investing, it's a long process, right? And a lot of people give up because you, you know, you start putting money into deals and those deals, the first thing that happens is those deals go belly up. Correct. Right? Yes. They don't exit first. Yes. Uh, your first eight or 10 or 20 deals or however many, you just lose money and you're like, get tired of it and you stop investing. Mm -hmm. Is it important to invest in a lot of companies and Diversify, or what's your opinion? I've heard two sides of this. Yeah, I've heard two sides of it as well. I think it really comes down to the investor, but uh, generally speaking, it's best to have a diversified portfolio. Number one, mm -hmm. number two, invest in invest uh, a small percentage of your net worth, so that if you lose the money, you're not you know out of luck. Um, and then also recognize that it's a long time horizon. I think a lot of investors don't realize it's a long time horizon. It'll be 10 years or plus before you see a meaningful exit. Um, there's no liquidity during that time frame. So somebody gets sick, you need to buy a new car, junior needs to go to college. 
no access to that capital. So, and then also people need to recognize do they have the right risk appetite uh, to become an investor as well. Mm -hmm. So about a hundred deals over what period of time? A hundred deals over the past 10 years. 10 years? Yeah. So, um, so to answer your, your original question about uh, uh, diversified portfolio, I'd say it's better to do, so there, there are two different schools of thought. One school of thought is be very, very targeted and be very, very select. Um, we have a mutual friend investor who does that, right? And picks on one company that he's super passionate about, and that's the one. Seven out of 1,400 exactly. pitches. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and then there's another there's another school of thought of having a diversified portfolio because you just need one company to return your your your, your investments. Uh, so I usually think about 20 to 30 companies um, as a first-time investor. Uh, and then you figure out, one, how much money do you want to allocate uh, to to uh, angel investing, how much you want to allocate to the to the firms, but also thinking about, do you have an investment thesis? Are you focused in a core sector or not? And also thinking about, um, d are you doing uh, only seed or are you also going to have uh, dry powder for follow-on rounds as well? Because sometimes, as you've seen, there are multiple seed rounds as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, and after 10 years, uh, how many of them roughly... I'm not, I didn't have you look up the stats, but you <laughs> I know, know, like, I, I know how many went out, today. have gone under and how many have really actually exited yet? I'm just trying to give people an idea of kind of that time horizon. Sure. So I would say, and I don't have my stats in front of me, mm -hmm. but I would say at least 10% have gone under mm -hmm. uh, and another 10% have exited. Um, and then another small percentage, maybe 5% are sort of zombie companies where they're alive, but they're just sort of flatline revenue, mm -hmm. uh, and the others are, you know, potentially upside as well. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, How do you think about angel investing? Yeah. Good question. Well, I mean, I got started for some similar reasons and found myself in California. Not, not, I didn't relocate, but, mm. um, I was trying to get involved in different syndicates and try to learn from investors that were currently in the market. How do I figure this out? Uh, and <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I, I am more in the camp of trying to diversify your portfolio. Mm -hmm. Um, and the statistics seem to bear that out. I think the, the ones that are, you know, in the camp of being highly selected do have maybe a fairly rare skill and evaluating and vetting and spending the time and due diligence in those companies to make that selection process. There is also um, some interesting statistics on how much time an angel investor spends on the due diligence of their investment versus how much money they actually get out of it. And the data really strongly suggests that the more time you spend, the better your outcome. Mm -hmm. So if you just blindly invest in somebody else's syndicate, for example, and count on them to do the due diligence, that may or may not work out, but the more time you can spend uh, evaluating it and knowing it and, and making a, a more informed decision, I think the better. So I think that plays out. I mean, if you look at both sides of the spectrum, mm -hmm. is you can uh, you can kind of find yourself more or less in a sweet spot, right? You know, where you're not spending the inordinate amount of time, of like I'm only looking for decacorns, right? right? Or I'm right. only looking for unit. I'm only hunting for unicorns, or just blindly throwing your cash over the wall. Um, and then also just trying to be a, you know, the smart money, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think we share an opinion on this where can I help uh, this particular startup with my background, with my network, with my business, with my knowledge, right? So that you give them a little bit of a, a leg up. I mean, what are the things that you think that maybe a startup investor uh, should think about when they're approaching an angel like yourself, uh, or they're looking for an angel investor. A f what, a from a founder's perspective? Yeah, from yeah. a founder, from a startup, yeah. Yeah, I think there are a couple of things. One is to consider um, the investor's um, area of interest or core focus. Mm -hmm. So what's, it, what's important to them? So some investors, all they care about is a monetary return and being able to answer that question. Some investors have exited bigly, we'll use that word, <laughs> and... Uh, Thinking about um, they've, they've exited bigly, and uh, their their concern is um, they just want to help uh, and see see a, an up and coming founder uh, 
exit as well. So they're not concerned about the capital return. It's important, but not primary importance. Others want to give back to to the ecosystem or other uh, affinity groups, people that want to focus on black founders, people want to focus on female founders, people that want to focus on LGBTQ founders. So finding out what's important to the investor and then tweaking your pitch to match that. Um, I also think a mistake people make is not doing diligence on the investors. So either following their Twitter, following their blogs and finding out what do they invest in. Some investors are very adamant about, I don't invest in music. I don't invest in X, Y, Z. So being very clear about that. Some people only invest in SaaS, so don't pitch them your whatever XYZ startup. So doing their homework, um, finding out what's important to the investor, and then also recognizing that it's a, it's a it's a barter transaction in the sense of what are you bringing to the table that the investor finds valuable, right? What do you have besides an idea? What have you built? Do you have an MVP? How much skin do you have in the game? I think all that's pretty critical. Uh, and then then of course uh, an important thing as well from an from an investor standpoint is understanding who's on the team, right? And, and being able to sell that, that you're the, the right team. So in summary, I would say uh, as a founder looking for money, the, the two critical things are you have to be a domain expert in your space, but then you also have to be a domain expert and people will fund your space as well. Mm. Yeah, I think that is an important point. Everyone talks about doing due diligence on the companies, but the founders need to be doing due diligence on the investors to see if it's even worth their time to try to pitch. Exactly. And it's like a marriage as well, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're, you're together for 10 years until you exit it. So, you know, do you want that person on your cap table? Do you get along? Are their insights helpful? Um, do you want to be in a conference room with them and work on stuff or not? I think that's a very common mistake. I mean, I see this even with companies approaching soft tech and I was going to ask you that question. What, what mistakes do you see? Well, I mean, I, I, one aligns with what you're talking about. And if I relate it to even my services business, the number of service businesses that approach soft tech to provide services for my business. And it's like, you guys didn't even pull up the web page. I, I, we're, we're, we're competitors. Right. There's no way I would actually use you as a service. So right. why are you wasting my time with the LinkedIn invite? Mm -hmm. I think uh, st uh, startup founders need to look at that as well. Like, mm -hmm. Why are you pitching me? SaaS. I'm an oil and gas guy. I only do real estate. I only mm -hmm. do gaming. I don't do hardware investments. I'm interested in med tech. There's a lot of investors out there, but like at least know who you're talking to. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. I want to talk a little bit about the differences of kind of what you've seen in California and maybe what you've seen here in 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 Houston. Because I, I set out uh, to, to start the Soft Tech Venture Studio here because I saw you know a, a big gap, frankly, <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> in Houston compared to what I was seeing in Silicon Valley, which everyone, you know, they're, they're the star up on the hill, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone wants to be Silicon Valley mm -hmm. or have an ecosystem like them. Um, I think the right approach is to like embrace your uniqueness and do something different. You don't want to be the same, you know, but uh, I know that you've been out in, in Silicon Valley for a while. Were there any like surprising insights of being there and in the market? Yeah, I would say the serendipitous nature of having tech conversations with random people on BART, mm -hmm. uh, at meetups, there were breakfast meetups, there were lunchtime meetups, there were after work meetups. So having lots of tech conversations randomly everywhere was surprising coming from New York. Um, everyone has a startup, everyone has a side hustle startup. So that was fascinating. Um, so, uh, in terms of comparing and comp contrasting Houston versus San Francisco, uh, uh, although I've come here multiple times as an advisor, I wouldn't say that I'm an expert in the ecosystem here, but I'd say the San Francisco ecosystem is far more mature, uh, which means which leads me to assume, and you correct me if I'm wrong, that there's lots of opportunity for growth here. Um, what I wonder about the ecosystem here is, uh, what is the opportunity for follow-on investments? Right, so are there enough companies here that do the series venture firms that do the Series A and Series B and Series C, or do you have to go outside of this ecosystem to help facilitate that? Yeah, it's an important point and something that we're also looking at and working on because you know, in order for the ecosystem to work, you need to have all of the pieces so you can complete a full circle. Mm -hmm. Right, so you have your pre-seed investors, your angels, your seed, mm -hmm. Series A, B, C, D, mm -hmm. and it all has to be here plus talent, plus support, plus market, all of this, and so you can get all the way around, get to that exit. Mm -hmm. Founders get money. Other people get money, then they start a startup and they start it all over again. 
right? Mm-hmm. But um, I do think there are still some missing pieces there. Like, you know, we, we put 64 companies up on the stage with seed and pre-seed investments. And, mm-hmm. you know, we, need, we do need more um, seed and Series A investors that then take the baton, invest in these companies and get them to the next point. Mm-hmm. Either that or we need to be doing that, right? Mm-hmm. So part of the part of our venture fund is actually half of it is reserved for those follow-on investors, but we can't lead every single one. Right. Right. And we want to make sure we're putting the right startups in front of these VCs, like getting to know the market. What are they looking for? Selecting the ones that we can put up on stage and like, hey, there here's here's four or five med tech companies, Mr. MedTech VC. Mm-hmm. You know, here's Space Tech, here's FinTech, here's, you know, whatever tech they're looking for. Um, SaaS, et cetera, uh, that they then will be willing to take a, you know, their checkbook out of their pocket or their Venmo nowadays, or I don't know. Or Cash App. Cash App, something. Or Bitcoin. Bitcoin, yeah. To, to provide them the, you know, take the baton and pass it to the next round and the next round, right? And um, I think there also needs to be a little more collaboration between the, uh, the VCs. Mm-hmm. Uh, a little bit more of that happens out there where one will lead, others follow on, pile yeah. in. Yeah. And <clears throat> there's a lot of companies that silo. This is my deal, mm-hmm. right? And we need to foster that you know, collaborative model. I think Texas is a very friendly, collaborative place so we can get there, mm-hmm. but we have to help enable it. Two-part question. Mm-hmm. What uh, has been your biggest challenge in standing up the startup studio? Mm-hmm. And the second part is what insights have you gleaned after running 64 companies through the, your ecosystem? Yeah, big questions. Mm-hmm. Biggest challenge. Well, I mean, I think anything's a challenge. Um, it was, you know, we First of all, we weren't sure we could raise a venture fund, being a first, first time you know, uh, venture fund for, for us. My, my other GP, he, he has had a VC fund before, mm-hmm. but he did it in Boston. Mm-hmm. Can we raise the money here in Houston? Um, and you know, our timing was, uh, a challenge, right? You know, the last year and a half has not been the greatest for, um, uh, finding extra money flowing around, right? There's been a lot of pressure on investors. Um, a lot of, uh, investments have gone down considerably, whether you're in crypto, whether you're in equities, whether you're in startups that, you know, maybe were failing or that were, you thought we're going to IPO and didn't. And so you didn't have that exit that you thought you were going to have. So, I mean, we've been fortunate that we raised, you know, 80% of the fund already mm-hmm. uh, being first time, you know, um, fund. And then also, the, you know, from the venture studio, whether we can convince startups to actually come into a studio and we've never run a studio before. Right. right? But um, I thought those were going to be the biggest problems, but in the end, you know, the idea really did resonate, Mm -hmm. um, both for the investors and the startups, Mm -hmm. where they saw the value of, you know, leveraging soft tech's services model that we've been doing product development Mm -hmm. uh, for 25 plus years, and that we could uh, de-risk the investment for the investors and then also be a great partner. Like you said, the smart money, like the extra smart money, having this fund plus studio plus services model that a lot of accelerators don't have. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm happy that like even this week, you know, one of the founders was telling me, you know, we've gone through two different accelerators and this is something like I've never seen before. That's fantastic. And we've had similar comments of founders coming through some of the big ones, Techstars, YC, 500 Global, Mm -hmm. you know, they've all, we've had them all actually come through. Mm -hmm. They've already gone through those programs and then they came into, to ours. So Mm -hmm. I'm, I am happy about that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, uh, certainly it's a challenging fundraising environment. Mm -hmm. Um, that's, not because of like our model, but just because of the market. The market's the know? current environment. So um, LPs are stressed, investors are stressed, everybody's mm-hmm. everybody's stressed. But you know, yeehaw! Put your arms up, enjoy the ride. And then insights. Insights. You know, uh, I I think that our approach is very similar to a startup. So mm-hmm. what we told our founders is that the studio is a startup. Gotcha. And so iterating right through each cohort, we started with, you know, five startups 
iterated, went to 14, iterated, went to 21, iterated, Mm -hmm. dropped it down to 15, this last cohort. Mm -hmm. Every time through making another pass, knowing, figuring out what we, what went right, what, what didn't, what didn't. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think it's still a little early, probably. I mean, we're about 18 months in, Mm -hmm. so we'll see, you know, once we get a little further along. In the end, uh, you know, how successful it is, but, you know, so far, so good. Um, I think that uh, what I see is just the the insight is that there's a lot of potential in this kind of model Mm -hmm. and that we could do it in, in, in more than one location. You know, we're... We're pulling startups not just from the local market, right? We don't have just a bunch of new wet behind the ears startup founders from Texas or something, right? right? We're pulling them from both coasts, you know, Mm -hmm. West Coast, East Coast, North and South. Mm -hmm. But then we're pulling them from Mexico, Latin America, as far away as Bahrain and Turkey and Kenya. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think that's been a little bit surprising Mm -hmm. um, that how far the reach has been. Mm -hmm. Uh, And... uh, you know, what our plans is to do is to, of course, go big, right? Our BHAG is, you know, a larger fund and, you know, more studios and other locations, mm-hmm. either here in Texas, mm-hmm. uh, whether you do it in Dallas and Austin and San Antonio or whether you need to, because we're already pulling from so many locations, locations. worldwide. It's yeah. like you almost don't need to be local. Right. Maybe one other insight is that because of our model, we decided to do one week per month in in person and the others not. So this actually allowed us to attract um, a lot of older founders, either ones that are leaving you know jobs running large departments at, at, at big companies or second time founders. They have families, they have responsibilities. They can't go 90 days into a program where they're forced to spend in Houston. And this has meant that we've had like a higher maturity uh, of our founders on a, and that they're coming to us. So that's been interesting. That's really great. I think that that's actually solves the problem because I've, I've heard that from other potential founders that they want to do this program, but they can't because of the time commitment or they have a family or they have a day job. So mm-hmm. I think you are feeling a need. Yeah. Seems so, so far. So, um, how are you involved in the studio? Because you're 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 a uh, an advisor in the yes. venture fund. No, thank you for having me involved. So mm-hmm. um, every cohort, uh, I do two things. So I do office hours. So most recently, uh, I do office hours for the for those startups. It's basically AMA. Ask me anything about startup fundraising, um, and answer their questions, give them insights about common mistakes, etc. Um, how to think about in fundraising, uh, and then I also do a talk uh, every cohort as well about. Um, uh, start, common startup fundraising mistakes mm. and how to avoid them, how to ha- okay. hack for that. Mm. Any any additional ones you want to share that you didn't uh, mention already? I had you mention a few of them, but... Yeah, I mean, uh, fundraising mistakes are, you know, not knowing your investor, not doing your due diligence. Uh, another another uh, mistake is not building a relationship with an investor before you're asking for money. So, you know, do you follow them on Twitter? Do you follow them on LinkedIn? Do you know who they are? Have you engaged with them in some other capacity? Um, so things of that, things of that nature. Do you subscribe to that adage? If you want money, ask for advice. If you want advice, ask for money. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the thing. Some people are for that, and some people are against that. Some people just say, just just ask for money. Like, don't waste the time. Other people say, I'd rather learn more about your company and sort of build a relationship and see are we aligned. Does it make sense? So it's really up to the investor and the founder. Mm, okay. Uh, what do you think uh, the Houston ecosystem has going for us that could make us more successful? I'd probably say uh, the location, uh, mild climate, central location, uh, strong university startup uh, programs as well. So I think it benefits from that. Uh, The proximity to Dallas, uh, Austin, San Antonio, uh, leveraging the uh, the startup ecosystem there in terms of other other founders, other universities, and also venture capital firms. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think that really, for me, trying to figure out how to unlock the amount of capital that's in Houston and in Texas, right? There's a lot of money here, Mm -hmm. just that that tends to want to invest it in real estate and oil and gas or holes in the ground or other more safer investments and Mm -hmm. trying to encourage the investment in the other alternative asset classes, Mm -hmm. which I think is starting to happen. 
um, especially if we can help them vet the tech, right? Because I get how it can be a little daunting to understand whether it's magic or not. All right, and you know, I normally ask uh, the guests like their favorite book, but I know you have a book coming out. Exactly. So uh, tell me a little bit about what the book's about and, um, you know, uh, why I should read it. So thank you for asking. So um, I'll go to the problem. The problem that I've seen in talking to early stage startups and founders is that they don't speak tech, right? They may not, they're not well versed in Silicon Valley speak. What is a cap table? What is a form 83B? What is regulation CF? You know, what's an angel investor versus an angel group versus a super angel? So I put together a book. Uh, it's coming out uh, shortly, uh, and it's called The Ultimate Startup Dictionary. Mm. Uh, and basically, it explains these terms in layman's English and gives you some, in, in some instances, gives you an example of, you know, what is a venture capital firm? What is an angel investor? What's a Form 83B, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So your advanced copy is coming soon. Well, I'm looking forward to tonight. Uh, I've got my Astro shirt on. It's the uh, championship, second second game. I think the, uh, not the championship, but they're going to give the championship rings out at the Astrodome tonight. So we're going to have, I think, 100 people there, yourself included. Thank you so much. Looking forward to it. Enjoy the game and see the Astros get their rings. Um, and then I have something for you. Oh. In my little box here. Thank you so much. Much enjoy. A lovely parting gift. A lovely parting gift for you. Uh-huh. Awesome. We didn't talk about this topic, but no, you like model it. trains. That is correct. Mm-hmm. So here we are. We have the uh, train socks. Train socks. Soft tech train socks. And it's a good luck sock as well. So <laughs> yeah. I love it. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks for being on the pod. I appreciate it. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much. 